Hello everyone, this is Dominic Cayley and welcome again to the Close Encounters series hosted by Impulse Creatives. I'm coming to you yet again from downtown Los Angeles, California, where it's a rather gloomy day outside, uh, one of the rare times that we have clouds and no sun. So uh, everyone I know out in California is crossing their fingers for some, some rain coming up. But today I would like to talk to you about and play for you the music of a composer who's very dear to my heart and someone that I've really been discovering and studying and appreciating much more in recent days, particularly during uh, this pandemic. So the composer that we're focusing on today in sort of a overview type way is the Czech composer, Erwin Schulhoff. So Erwin Schulhoff was a composer that was born at the end of the 19th century, 1894, and he would have died in 1942. So he lived approximately 48 years, and in these 48 years, it's rather shocking how much he produced as a, as a composer, how much he, he performed, and how much he influenced his fellow colleagues, composers, artists, and more. So, again, this is another example of a man, a composer, who, like Mendelssohn, like Schubert, uh, like other composers, like Mozart, whose lives were cut short due to illness or other tragedies, as I will get into, he, this is a man that in his mere 48 years of life just produced a massive amount of quality and, and, and of quality compositions, I guess, that really, I think, are unknown and, and Unfortunately, mostly forgotten today. So, Schulhoff was indeed first and foremost a pianist. This was his first instrument. He was encouraged by the, the highly esteemed composer Antonin Dvorak, uh, I guess the hero of Czechoslovakia at the time, the, the hero composer. He was encouraged by Dvorak to apply for the Prague Conservatory, which he attended at the age of 10. And he was, uh, by recommendation letter from Dvorak, mind you, and while studying, he developed, first of all, a very facile and wonderful piano technique. But in addition, he realized that his passions were really centered as a composer. So, so basically, I would say that it wasn't until mm, his teenage years, particularly his early 20s, that he really came into his own, into his, his early compositional projects and, 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 and works. I have selections from various pieces to play for you today. Um, pieces that I will dig into deeper as these, these, these Close Encounters series continue. But I, I just wanted to give you a, a really nice overview of, of who Shulov was and why he's important. Mm, first of all, many, some of you may never have even heard of Erwin Schulhoff, and you would not be alone in, in, this, in, in this lack of knowledge. I had not personally known much about Schulhoff until, I would say, about half a year ago. He's a composer that I've heard before in, in various concerts, but not someone that I truly appreciated or really... Did, basically knew anything about until I started really becoming more and more invested and involved in the wonderful project entitled Recovered Voices that takes place in Los Angeles and sponsored by the Colburn School among other organizations. This, this organization Recovered Voices is all about basically rediscovering, recovering, and unearthing the music of composers who were primarily stifled or wiped out by the Nazi regime of the 1930s and 40s. Schulhoff being one of the composers who was unfortunately, um, well, decimated by this regime. So as a result, there are many, there are many reasons why his music might not be as popular, popular as it should be. But as a result, he, his music was just forgotten, unfortunately. And even after his death, 
his colleagues who held him in high esteem, they, the world was in turmoil and everyone was worried about what was next and rather than what happened previously. So yes, I, much of his music has been an unbelievably pleasant surprise to me and refreshing to hear, to listen to, and to perform. So I look forward to, again, playing a few selections for you. In his early years, Shulhoff was, well, he was never conventional, but he wrote some, some pieces that, ha that held a bit more of a standard type of performance practice. He wrote a piece called A Partita when he was in his, I would say, late 20s, early 30s. And this is a, an early work where he exemplifies his love for jazz and for dance. So the partita is a, is a form of music. Basically, it's a, a book containing different chapters, is what it is, musically speaking. Each movement is a different type of dance, and this was popularized by the Baroque composer Johann Sebastian Bach. So with Schulhoff, he takes it to a different level. Instead of writing these Baroque antiquated dances, Schulhoff decides to write his own jazzy dances, foxtrots, um, tangos, uh, all different types of, uh, of dances, ballroom dances that at the time were very popular. So I'll play you a quick selection from from, from his part It's the fourth movement. It's, it's, uh, it, it, there's no title to it. The, the tempo marking is Tempo of a Fox in Hawaii. So I think that basically translates to a Hawaiian foxtrot, which is a, a ballroom dance. It's not terribly quick, I would say. It's, it, in many ways, it's a rather cute dance where two people interlope and, and they, they give and take as they dance with each other. And in this one, I definitely hear a little bit of this tropical island atmosphere mixed in with Schulhoff's wonderful modernistic language. So I'll start by playing this, this movement for you from Schulhoff's Partita. <laughs> Rather cute work indeed by Schulhoff. It has this wonderful, slightly chromatic and dissonant offbeat type figure. And for me, uh, it, it really mixes a modernistic style at the same time with this charming little type of dance that you could see two people just slowly, well, moderately again, moderately kind of swaying to. So again, the partita, this partita contains uh, several other dance pieces, but for me, this is perhaps one of my, 
I'm quite fond of it due to its, its really charming nature, I would say. And again, the, the idea of dance, the idea of jazz, um, the idea of dance and jazz is something that, that Schulhoff would always embody throughout his, his career. He, he did write some pieces that are um, more in the vein of, of a standard modernistic contemporary language, like his sonatas. But around the same time that he was writing this piece, he was writing piano concerti. He wrote a few piano concertos, three in fact. The first two are for solo piano and orchestra. The third concerto is actually a double concerto for flute, piano, and orchestra. I particularly love both of his solo piano concertos a lot. Um, I play both. The first is probably more very conventional in many ways. It sounds... Um, I would say it sounds like uh, an influence of Scriabin and Strauss, those two composers. And actually, the second concerto, though, I find to be absolutely brilliant. In fact, I, I, think, it's, I think it's a masterpiece in many ways. And what's really interesting about Schulhoff is that one of my experiences with him is when I play his music, when I listen to his music, I'm always struck by thinking, wait a minute, this sounds like something else. It sounds like some, some other piece that I've heard, that I've played. That, and I say, huh, let me investigate this. So let's take the second piano concerto. Um, the very opening of it uh, begins, begins like this. piano actually keeps on playing these he keeps on playing these these intervals these these harmonies for gosh a few minutes actually as the orchestra does solos and and they, they create this lugubrious type of texture but again when I when I first heard his concerto um, these harmonies This sounds like a composer, perhaps Debussy Ravel, this type of harmonic language, but then when I heard this, the first thing I could think of was Ravel's G major concerto. Both of these concertis start with they're a little different, sure, but they start with this type of texture in the piano, where the piano is accompanying the the orchestra, and with this this figuration in, in, in the up up top, same same octave uh, placement, and the orchestra plays solos, and it's it's quite. But again, for me, to my ears, uh, the beginning of the Ravel versus. Find to be quite similar, and in fact, Schulhoff would have written his concerto seven years prior to Ravel, and we know for a fact that Ravel was influenced, admired, and appreciated Schulhoff's music. We know this. Um, so, uh, to say that Ravel might have been influenced by this texture—it's it, probably. I mean, the notes are different, sure, but the texture, this high texture accompanying the orchestra in this. This, this figuration going up and down the exact same contour, I find it to be just strikingly similar. And the first time I heard Schulhoff's concerto, I said, this sounds like Ravel. And this is not the first time I would say this uh, about his music. So, so yes, I, I, uh, I, I think that uh, some other very famous composers would have been influenced by, by Schulhoff's work. Um, the other early work that Schulhoff would have written is a wonderful set of pieces entitled Five Pictures. Five Pittoreske is, is, is a German word he used, but it, it translates to Five Pictures. This would have been written in 1919, give or take. And, <clears throat> and basically, so again, Schulhoff would have been all of 25 years old. This would have been his first period of, 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 of music making. 
He studied briefly in 1913 with Claude Debussy, a very famous composer that we all know, and ironically, Debussy and him did not get along at all. Debussy was someone that Shulhoff admired quite a bit, and Shulhoff was inspired and thought that if Debussy taught anything like how Debussy composed, they would get along just fine. But uh, Debussy actually was a very conservative teacher, very strict, rule regimented, and pretty, uh, pretty quickly uh, Shulhoff was disenchanted with this, this rigorous type of compositional training and, and, and left the left the conservatory. But again, but still, he was influenced by, by Debussy's music, maybe not the lessons he took, but by the music, certainly, that he heard. And, but the five Pitoresque, which had been written around this time, again, employ dance pieces, dance music. Um, I'll play, I'll play, let's see here, I'll play the first one for you. Um, and again, each one of these pieces is not entitled anything. It simply has a tempo that says tempo of a blank. Tempo of a, well, this is a foxtrot again. The tempo of a foxtrot in this first piece. And um, it's a wonderful opening. And again, this would have been written in 1919. Schulhoff's all of 25 years old. This is his first period of music making, I would say, where he's really trying to, well, actually, I'll get into this. This is his first sliding into a second period. But I would say this first movement is still rather conventional in some ways. charming piece and a bit more, I would say, uh, proud or perhaps uh, elevated in some ways, uh, this Foxtrot, which was written in 1919. Again, this would have been written a little bit earlier than the Partita. 
And um, something that Schulhoff struggled with throughout his life would have been his politics and how he felt about art and how he felt about the world. Because um, he, was, he was definitely a composer who was not satisfied with simply writing music. He was a composer that really tried to absorb the world he was living in and translate it appropriately and write music that um, was meaningful to the time. So one thing that's, that's absolutely stunning, well, shocking, is that he, he was a, a soldier in World War I. In 1917, he was fighting um, on the Russian front. He, he, he was wounded. He, he suffered frostbite, nervous shock. He, he suffered uh, some calamities like that. Nothing that was debilitating per se, but certainly he suffered. He was a POW, a prisoner of war in Italy. He was then sent back out to fight. And this, all of this chaos, destruction, and, and, and loss of life certainly caused him to question what, human, what mankind was doing in this world, really. So he did, he never strayed away from the fact that he loved dance, he loved jazz, he loved writing music that was absolutely pleasing to, to listen to. But for a time, he certainly did enter into what's called a Dadaist phase. Dada, Dadaism is where basically art is seen in whimsical, humorous ways. People often say art is nonsense, art is frivolous, uh, it's not meaningful, art should not have these grave, serious, underlying messages. Art is just there for some enjoyment, and it should be spontaneous, it should be free, it's very just um, experimental in many ways. So, so sometimes, um, in some of his music, uh, he, he really tried to experiment with, with, with uh, his compositional technique. And I, well, oh, I, I see a comment that says, ragtime influences can be heard. And I absolutely agree. Because um, he certainly cared a lot about ragtime. In fact, actually, speaking of that, I think I'll play the next movement of Pittoreskin, which is entitled Ragtime. So you'll get to hear actually what he really thought about ragtime in this particular work. Um, again, it writes tempo of a ragtime. So let's, yeah, let's play the second, I'll play the second movement of Pittoreskin entitled Ragtime. And let's see if this is a ragtime that you're familiar with, because I find this ragtime to be, uh, I say a fresh take, a, his a individual, very unique take on ragtime.
So that piece is entitled Ragtime, Tempo of a Ragtime. So this is where I really find it to be such a refreshing take on this style. Because again, we're, we're Ragtime, I, I agree, the first piece that I, the, the, this first uh, Foxtrot, uh, this is more reminiscent perhaps of a Scott Joplin Maple Leaf Rag or Scott Joplin's Ragtime. But I find it so, so kind of charming that uh, in Schulhoff's eyes, his ragtime has this sort of uh, more of a French impressionistic type accompaniment. It's this. Um, it's, it's this really kind of, I, I would say it's a, a ragtime from a European eyes. It's, it's interesting because um, as an American, you know, we grew up listening to ragtimes in a Scott Joplin type way. So when I first heard this, my first instinct was, this is a ragtime that I've, unlike any that I've ever, I've ever heard. And, but I find it to be really, really special, particularly the middle section where uh, he has a wonderful, it's a sort of an interlude in this, this middle section. It's, it's extremely nice. But again, the first two movements of this piece are rather uh, conventional in some ways. Beautiful, jazzy, and pleasing to the ear. But again, I had mentioned earlier that he was interested in the Dada movement of what is art? Especially after having fought in World War I and seeing the atrocities of it, Schulhoff was questioning what the point of everything is. So he decided in this third movement of Pittoreskin to really sort of experiment to, 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 to the next degree. And I will, I will show you um, the score of this third movement and you can tell me well, you can let me know what you think. So here is the complete third movement of Pittoreskin. We see it's entitled In Futuro, which means in the future, basically. And so he has some writing um, beneath the, in, in, on the first score, where uh, on the first line that says the whole piece with free expression and feeling, always until the end. So, of course, as you're looking at this score, you'll notice that there are no notes. It's just all rests, it's all silence. This is a piece that is all silence. You'll see some funny markings. You'll see little commas, which are supposed to be breath marks. You'll see question marks. I don't think anyone knows what these question marks mean. You'll see exclamation points. I still don't think anyone knows what they really mean. You'll see what almost looks to me on the third system, the third line, you'll see these smiley faces um, at the last bar, uh, and, and then a frowning, face, a frowning face below. And again, um, you see all these rests, and you see them in very complicated manner, ways, and you wonder, what does this really mean? Well, uh, in, in addition, uh, uh, another funny thing about this piece is at the very beginning, you'll notice that the, for, for people that, that know the, the, the piano, you start with the treble clef on the top stave and you start with the bass clef on the bottom stave, but they're flipped this time. Now we have a bass clef up top and a treble clef below. And in addition, these numbers next to it, 3, 5, and then 7, 10, well, um, normally you'll have a piece that has the same markings, 4-4, four, 4-4. Four, four, four. But here we've got different time signatures for each hand, again, in pure silence. So this is where Schulhoff is basically writing a piece purely about silence, where as you're reading it, I feel like he's kind of, he's kind of sort of guiding you along as you, every exclamation point is, is What's this? What's this? What does this mean? And 
and finally until the, the very grand pause, which is on the one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, on the sixth system, we see martial pause, we see grand pause. It's a big silence, and you see four exclamation points. And I find this to be kind of funny because up to this point, anyone would think that this has been a grand pause altogether. Again, there's, there's been silence this whole time. So, so this extra grand pause is even more ridiculous and even more of a Dada type, you know, nonsense type of uh, manner. Now, I don't necessarily, I don't at all think that this is a nonsense piece, to be blunt. I, one thing that I've always been intrigued about Schulhoff is that despite his constant struggles with negotiating whether art is meaningful or not in one of the most chaotic, turbulent times of human history in, in, the, in the early um, 20th century, he still could not help himself to, but to be a rather serious composer and write music of great integrity and importance. So, so for me, uh, there is, you, you might be thinking, uh, some, of, some of you that might know are thinking, well, there's another piece of there's another piece of music of all silence that was written by John Cage entitled Four Minutes and 33 Seconds. And you're thinking, oh, and like I was thinking, you're like, oh, well, Schulhoff copied it. Or did he? I mean, as I was studying, I realized that Schulhoff wrote this 30 years before John Cage. Interesting, isn't it? And John Cage um, is quite famous for this piece, for its originality, and ironically, he was praised for that. And Unfortunately, we have a composer clearly writing the same thing with, in my opinion, a bit more intriguing elements than John Cage. Now, John Cage's piece is in two movements. He writes tempo markings, he writes silence, he writes just tacit. And um, in this, this piece, In Futurum, you just, I mean, honestly, it's almost a visual work of art where you look at all these rests and all of these markings and you can just spend, a, you can spend a while just gazing upon it, pondering it, just thinking. So personally, um, so personally, I find this piece to be more satisfying, uh, artistically speaking and uh, compositionally speaking than, than John Cage's because this opens up so many different types of dialogue that one can have. For example, like I had mentioned, uh, I, I've, I've seen several performances of this piece and they're all different. Um, and there's many interpretive type things that you can, you can consider. Again, I mean, for me, um, I see bass clef on top, I see treble clef on bottom. What does that tell me? Well, it tells me perhaps the hands start like this, crossed. And you, you could disagree with me, you could say they start like this. I don't, I don't have an answer, and I, 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 this is a piece that I'm, I'm still trying to interpret uh, to the best of my ability. But on a very practical note, what Schulhoff, Schulhoff never really uh, specified exactly the meaning behind this piece. It's very ambiguous and very mystical, but John Cage did specify with his piece, 4 minutes and 33 seconds, that the idea of this silence is that we as human beings are very rarely silent. We're either listening to things, we're talking, we're sleeping, we're... And to spend four minutes and 33 seconds, in John Cage's case, uh, just sitting in your environment, ambient environment, and just listening and heightening your sense of alertness, um, that's something that is a unique event and something we don't take into account. I've seen performances of four minutes and 33 seconds by John Cage where you're in a concert hall and you, you start hearing creaks and you hear the building, you actually hear the building in ways that you never knew it, 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 it was. I think in Futurum is kind of similar where, again, I believe that despite, uh, despite Shulov writing his piece and perhaps people thinking, oh, it's just nonsense. And, and he probably agrees that it is, it is nonsense. You know, what is, what is uh, just written out silence of all these bars of rest. But I still think that there's an intriguing elements to it. And, um, and I think that it's, again, if anything in this, this five movement work, if anything, this is, a, is, this is an interlude where, whereby the performer can take a breath before beginning the, the next movement. And the performer can basically 
sit in silence and just ponder, well, whatever he would like to. Uh, sometimes, you know, arguably for, between pieces, we've seen artists that will, will literally sit for a minute or two and, 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 and wait to enter the zone to, end, to play the next piece. So this might not be much different. It's just a written out break, I guess, in the, in the form of a third movement and in, in the, and in the form of a very intriguing format and style. So I'm going to move on to uh, one of my one of my favorite pieces that Schulhoff wrote. And actually, before I do so, I'd like to actually show you what Schul who Schulhoff was as a man and what he looked like. So here we see two photos. Well, yes, uh, photos of Schulhoff. Uh, of course, on the left is Schulhoff, and on the right is Schulhoff with a, a dancer that he was working with. Her name was Milka Mayerva, and they, again, they, they worked quite a lot together. As you can see from some of the music that I played for you today, he was obsessed with dance, with jazz, with all kinds of ballroom steps and, and dance techniques. What's really interesting about Schulhoff is that in contrary to a lot of the rather conservative German tradition that he was currently living in, again, to put things in perspective, he, would have been, he was born in 1894, and um, Brahms would have died in, in 1893, or, or, sorry, 1897. And basically, we're talking about transitioning from this golden age of Brahms into this new world and, and, and people like Janacek, Dvorak, well Dvorak was a little bit earlier, but people like Janacek, like Schulhoff, Martineau, all these different uh, composers, Debussy, they're all part of this transitional type period. And basically, in contrary to the idea that the symphony, the orchestral hall was the place of ultimate musical satisfaction. There's a wonderful quote that Schulhoff said uh, in, in a, one of his letters to a friend. He said, head to the bars and you'll find more music than in the concert halls of this world. I have an incredible passion for sophisticated dance and there are times when I dance night to night with barmaids solely out of enthusiasm for rhythm and a subconscious sensuality that gives me a phenomenal source of inspiration because my consciousness is unbelievably grounded, even almost animalistic. So Schulhoff was unfortunately not making a living as a composer throughout his life. He made a living as a jazz pianist, he made a living as a, an accompanist, he made a living as a, as a radio pianist, just playing little jingles and stuff. And so, by all accounts from, from, from people and stories, he wasn't always the, the happiest gentleman. As you can see, some of his music is, is, quite, is quite beautiful, and uh, it really wasn't respected all that much. It was, um, unfortunately, coming from Brahms, coming from Dvorak, coming from composers that were writing really serious music, um, the Ger and also being in Germany at the time where tradition was paramount. Paramount, and uh, we see that Schulhoff might have been thought of as a lesser composer, unfortunately, by some of his intellectual intellectual colleagues. Now, I'll play one last selection for you briefly before I I I, I, I talk a bit more about Schulhoff. This this selection is from his left hand suite, a piece for the left hand alone, and. This is written for a pianist named Ottavar Holloman. Ottavar Holloman was a, a pianist who, in World War I, a bullet went through his, well, through his right hand. He, he could still use it, but it was impaired quite a bit. So he tried to commission composers to write music for him. Janacek, another Czech composer, Schulhoff, and others. And in this work, I, it's one of my favorites, again, because I find it to be so just beautiful, unique, fresh, and so many different, it's, 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 it's really experimental, and you can sense that Schulhoff is really, um, he has his own voice here. This is written in 1926, give or take, and 
This is sort of his neoclassical era. And actually, the beginning of this piece, more than anything, I find really sounds like a little bit out of, out of Debussy's page uh, playbook. Uh, it, it's a little bit impressionistic. It's, it, it's entitled Preludio, so it's kind of opening up the piece. But the harmonies are, are gorgeous, and again, it's shocking how exquisitely he writes for the left hand. So I'm going to play the Preludio for the left hand suite. And again, remembering that they didn't get along, but Schulhoff did admire the great composer Debussy. So this is the Preludio from the Left Hand Suites. I will definitely look to be playing all of these pieces in, in a complete format for you in, in coming weeks. Uh, today I wanted to give you a taste of, of who this man is and to show you why you should um, be interested in him. And to end on things, I, again, it, it's, it's, it's only my opinion that I love this music dearly. but. The first thing that I thought, of course, when I was listening to a lot of this stuff for the first time was 
why does no one play this? Why have I never heard of this? I'm ashamed to say that I had never heard of any of this piano music until this past May, April or May of this past year. I heard some of the I heard a string quartet of his. I I heard a flute sonata of his, but his entire piano repertoire, which is extensive, and I'm only playing for you several of uh, these major works that he wrote. Um, his, his piano repertoire is extensive, and I had simply never heard of any of this stuff. So, first, my, my first uh, thought was, well, I have to listen to everything, and I, di I, I certainly did as much as I could find, which was concerning. In other words, there's very few recordings of a lot of his music. In fact, even finding the scores, the musical scores of his music, is extremely hard. And I started thinking about that a bit, and I, I, it, it does unfortunately make sense because um, as I researched more and more, when he was basically imprisoned by the Nazis in 1941, he, they tried to erase him out of existence, and unfortunately they almost succeeded. They, the photographs that I showed of you earlier um, are some of the only photographs that still exist of him due to so many of them being destroyed by the Nazis. And some of his manuscripts were destroyed. Um, today, I, I've had to do, I mean, simply finding his music is, is, is really difficult because it's, it's published by only one company and even then, not all of it's always available. So, um, it begs the question, why, why was he really forgotten and, and why um, did people not necessarily play his music and why, why, you know, why is that? Because when you listen to his music, you think, well, in some ways, it's a different type of jazzy dance impressionistic style that has a wonderful Czech type flavor to it. And at least for me, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a nice, fresh glass of orange juice. It's just so refreshing and really brilliant, I would say. And one of the reasons is that uh, when we look at musical history, we look at World War II, which was probably the most uh, destructive event, perhaps, in the 20th century. After that, we see that composers became obsessed with uh, setting rules for, their, for music, setting rules for music. Because again, after the chaos of World War II, people wanted order. People wanted, we don't want this to happen again. We don't want you know, another world war. We want to know our place in the world. We want to understand what is supposed to be happening. We want to, and this was reflected in art and, and music in many ways. There is a form of music called serialism. Serial, serialism is basically where we have 12 notes. We have, and then it repeats. And then it keeps going up and down the keyboard. And in serialism, the rule is that you must, of all these different notes, you must use each one before you can use the note again. So if I use C, I cannot use C again until I have played every other note that's available. So that's a pretty strict rule, isn't it? And as a result, we got music that sounds at times by Schoenberg, by Baird, by Webern, by all, all, all these other German composers after World War II. We get music that almost doesn't feel sometimes, these are, these are geniuses by certainly, but sometimes some of their music feels too regimented in some ways, at least for my taste. And also by rejecting the old ways in favor of the new, which was dictated by rules, by regulations, by you cannot break this, 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 this rule about using notes, if, you know, by breaking these rules, uh, by, by not breaking these rules, I guess, it, it, it created music that was a little bit not natural in, in some ways. That's not the way natural, that's not the way that humans naturally operate by always following a cycle. And as a result, uh, this kind of old style of music that, that Shulhoff had written was considered to be nice I mean, and, and, and beautiful, but not important. And that's, that's really a shame because um, composers of, of of that time considered music of importance to be that that was constructed following these rules. But again, if we look throughout history, we see people like Alvin Berg, we see Shostakovich, Ravel, we see Debussy, Dvorak, we see 
Janacek. We see lots of these composers that admired Schulhoff, spoke very highly of him. Um, and unfortunately, after his death, there was no real, uh, no one was really playing his music. It was, it was lost, it was destroyed by the Nazis. And unfortunately, uh, they were very thorough in trying to eliminate him and basically his legacy from the world. So as a result, um, I mean, it's, it's really important, not just Schulhoff. I mean, this is a whole, there's so many other composers that this was imposed upon by the Nazis that, that, that they, that they um, exterminated, like Toch, like Weinmann, and, um, Kaufmann, and, and many other composers. But Schulhoff is a composer that I've just taken a fascination with lately. And, and for me, digging into his music, really understanding who he is as a person, and really looking at all facets of his work is what allows me to really appreciate him more and more. And I look forward to sharing more of his pieces and, and many more of his, his works with you as, as, as time keeps progressing. Certainly, um, I have other live streams coming up where I'll be performing his music. Uh, again, primarily his left hand, his Reskin, and other, other works that I'm currently working on right now. But um, I look forward to, yes, uh, continuing to share his music and its importance. Because I find that in addition to his music being simply mm, beautiful and, 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 and really pleasing to hear, uh, it, it has uh, an underlying meaning a lot of the time. And um, I guess, I, you know, for, for, for me to play this music and to show how, how beautiful it is for, for the, the audiences, and it, it's really important to share that, I would say, especially to, to kind of respect and honor this man who, who really was unfairly persecuted um, by, by the Nazis. So um, with that, I think I'll play one last piece for you. The second movement of the left hand suite. This piece is um, a beautiful work and it's entitled Air. And we, 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 you hear the word air, and you might think, oh, air, that's a Baroque form. That's a Baroque dance. That's a Baroque word that Bach used, that Telemann used, that Handel used. And in some ways, this piece is sort of, I would say, uh, reflective of that. Um, it has this Baroque type essence to it, and it's really simple and beautiful in its, its natural state. So I hope you enjoy Air, the second movement of the left hand suite. Thank you. 
So this piece is a truly contemplative work and one of real beauty and just exemplifying who Schulhoff could really was. Who, and um, I, I would like to play actually one more work just to end things on a bit more of a, of a, more of a fun note per se. There's a wonderful movement entitled Zingara, the third movement of this left hand suite. It's supposed to be this Hungarian type of festive dance, or more of a, not a dance, I'd say more of a, more of a party. We have all these different instruments, all these, well, one instrument, of course, but in this we have lots of different drums and tambourines, I imagine, and all kinds of wonderful um, Zingarez type of styles. So, um, yeah, this is the third movement. certainly as fun to try and play with one hand as I could imagine it could be to play uh, his music, this piece, with two hands. But again, um, as I'm playing this left hand suite, it's a real marvel to see just how precise, how exacting, and how really perfect Shulhoff is able to negotiate uh, some constrictions uh, for just one hand. But I look forward to playing more of this piece and others for you about Shulhoff. And thanks for joining me today. I, I really enjoyed uh, sharing this music that I really dearly love. And I'd like to thank Cindy and Alexander, as always, for hosting Close Encounter series. And Impulse for Creatives for giving this platform on Twitch for me to share some of my, um, some of my, some of my passions during this time. And... Um, yeah, thanks everyone for, for joining today. It's been a pleasure. Have a good night, good morning, uh, good afternoon, wherever you might be. And see you next time. Bye-bye.